No, let me see. Oh, there we go. Yes. Got it. Okay, got it. So, well, good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much for attending this workshop, Zoom meeting. Uh, through TAPO, the Electro Music Performers Organization. Uh, this is a workshop titled The Search for, for Polyphony from 1970 to 1983, presented by Dr. Mike Matley. Uh, in Colorado, uh, somewhere, right? Denver? Yeah. Or oh, no. Denver. Uh, about, a, about an hour north of, of Denver. My God, are you gray, Dave. Yeah, I know. I am, too. I am, too. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Old friend Dave Fulton. Um, yeah, I'm in northern Colorado, about, about 45 minutes north of Denver, uh, about halfway between Denver and the Wyoming border. A uh, nice, quiet little town called Longmont. Um, and uh, Gianni, I just want to be on record as saying thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everybody at Tempo for, for having me here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to giving this talk. Thank you very much for doing this presentation for us, which will be very inspiring. Uh, since oh, I, I don't know about that, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. So are, are we good to go? Is there anything else? Yes, please, sir. Okay. Uh, I'll ask people to please mute themselves. Um, the, the, the structure of this little seminar uh, is going to be in five parts, and I'm going to stop after every one and encourage questions and answers. Um, I really, you know... I, Everybody, about half the people here have worked with me and they all know that I can talk like nobody's business. But um, I, uh, I'm, I'm really encouraging some feedback because some of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about is not really, let's say, uh, commonly liked wisdom uh, in the world of electronic music. Um, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be hitting on some points that are uh, maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, that having been said, uh, I'm gonna get started. Um, so, uh, as most of you probably know, um, I'm the author of a new book called Synth Gems One. I'll talk about that toward the end of the, the, the talk, if we have time, uh, which is, by the way, now on sale, um, bukes.com has it, and, um, I haven't got a copy yet. You know, Gianni was asking, you know, where's my copy? And I'm like, dude, where's my copy? Um, they are starting to show up at retailers in, in Europe, in the EU, but uh, they have not yet arrived in the States. And I'm hoping I have mine before the on-sale date in November, because if my friends start getting their copies before I get mine, I'm going to be very annoyed. Um, however, I happen to have a, a print quality PDF of it uh, here, so I can answer questions. And... Um, I'll be talking a little bit about the aim of the book and that sort of thing toward the end. But a lot of the research that I have done for the book is what sort of formed the, the basis for this talk. Uh, just to sort of let you know where I'm coming from, the, the technological process of creating polyphony on synthesizers took about 10 years, really, 10, 10 or 11 years. And it was informed by a lot of different sources. It wasn't just a question of technology. Uh, there was a lot of economics, and uh, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of tradition involved. And I, in tradition, I don't just mean sort of the grand uh, the grand scheme of things that we all look back to. Uh, I mean tradition in terms of being hidebound. Um, there were there were decisions made along the way uh, in response to popular pressure that pushed synthesis in a direction that you know we look back now and we're not really sure that you know it could have happened any other way. But honestly, there were a lot of different ways things could have gone. And I'm going to start with some historical background to talk about uh, where we come from. And by the way. If you do have a question, please do feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me and ask, because um, I, ah, Mike Hunter, just in time. Look at that. Um, so uh, if people do have questions, I'm going to ask that, uh, that you just stop me, and I will make a point of stopping, uh, as I said, at several points throughout the talk 
so that we can uh, we can get caught up. I, I, I honestly do encourage um, uh, questions and answers. So uh, part one of the talk is what I call history. How do we get here? Um, and we're going to start our talk with the the world's really the world's first synthesizer. It was a an additive synth. Um, which created extremely complex waveforms out of multiple sine wave uh, partials. Uh, and it had a large number of real-time uh, controls for altering the ratios of those partials uh, as one played. And um, I think all of you are probably aware of the fact that what I'm talking about is the pipe organ. Um, the, the, uh, the pipe organ is basically a big additive synthesizer. Uh, and uh, over the years of its development, it uh, actually pioneered a lot of the user interface things that, that people are used to. Pipe organs had the first foot pedals, they had the first foot switches, um, things like, uh, you know, uh, buttons uh, and sliders and registers. Those all had mechanical beginnings uh, in the pipe organ. But what I want to talk about with respect to the pipe organ is the idea of articulation. Um, pipe organs don't have any. You, you press a key, you get a sound, you release the key, the sound goes away. That's how they're built. Um, there's a little bit of sort of background noise from the bellows opening and closing and, and that sort of thing. But by and large, uh, for the first couple hundred years of keyboard music, uh, people didn't need articulation. Notes appeared, notes went away. Um, and there was, there was no problem with it because it was all people knew. Um, where things started to change was with the invention of, um, uh, the, the pipe organ is considered an aerophone. It is a, um, it is an instrument which is created by the movement of air, uh, which makes it sound by the impulse of air. But when other instruments came along, um, they used different mechanisms. The, uh, the harpsichord, uh, of course, used uh, plucking strings. Uh, the clavichord and the, 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 uh, the spinet and the pianoforte and eventually the piano of today were all percussion instruments. You threw a hammer uh, against a string to make it vibrate. Uh, and these instruments really took off because, let's face it, it's not easy if you want to make your own music to have a pipe organ in your living room. Uh, the, the harpsichord, the clavichord, and, and all of the successive instruments were a lot more portable. They were a lot smaller. And uh, they very rapidly spread throughout the, the, the world of people who had enough money uh, and education to know how to play them. And what ends up happening when you have a situation like that is human beings tend to associate certain sounds with certain places. And over the years, leading right up until the 20th century, the pipe organ was something you heard in church. It, you, you didn't really listen to it anywhere else except, you know, in, in certain cultural environments. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember a uh, pizza parlor organ or, you know, and there were theater organs and that sort of thing. But by and large, the organ was something whose articulation you were used to in a big space with a lot of reverb. And for smaller venues and homes, what you listened for was first the, uh, the, the sound of a harpsichord and later the sound of the piano. And what I like to say is as, pian as pianos got more affordable and, you know, this is before broadcast music where people would sit back and listen. If you wanted music, you made it yourself. Uh, the piano was the place where families congregated. And what this did was it created a, a, a mental tradition, and I'd almost say a rut, uh, where people who think of keyboards think of the piano. And that had real repercussions on how electronic music developed. In the early part of the 20th century, of course, uh, we had the Hammond organ, the home organ, um, and its many, you know, competitors, Wurlitzer and, and, and so on. And that was where, when you started seeing electric circuits creating uh, these sounds, that's when you started getting things like percussion. Because um, people 
at home expected a little bit more note shape, a little bit of a more percussive envelope uh, with a, 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 a noise, a transient, which uh, starts the note and then very gradual and then quickly dies away. And so you would have on your standard Hammond organ, you'd have second and third harmonic percussion with or without fast decay. And that was a nod toward what people expected when they listened to a piano. Uh, and then we move forward to the 1960s and uh, Bob Moog um, and Herb Deutsch designing the one of the two of the world's first uh, intended to be commercially available synthesizers. Uh, the other one, of course, was Don Buchla. And uh, Bob actually spent a fair bit of time trying to decide what sort of a, um, what sort of a performance interface he wanted the, the Moog to have. Uh, and there were really strong uh, arguments in favor of either um, giving it an extremely uh, unique uh, user interface that was sort of aimed at the uh, the experimental musician who was trying to create new sounds. And then there was the argument that, you know, organs have keyboards, keyboards are switches. Uh, switches make envelope triggering easy, you know. And um, so, uh, and it also makes, you know, you can, you can uh, attach to a keyboard bus bar you know, you can measure the voltage. And so it's easy to, to pick out a pitch once you've got your, your, your tracking set. And it also has the advantage of when you see this gigantic thing, which looks like a telephone switchboard, you have no idea what it is. But if you see that it's got a keyboard in front of it, you realize that in some bizarre alternate reality, this thing is a musical instrument. And Herb Deutsch uh, argued very strongly for that. And um, Frank Benneman, good to see you. And um, uh, Herb Deutsch argued uh, very strongly in favor of the, uh, the Moog synthesizer having a keyboard. Now at the time, uh, envelope control uh, was very primitive, uh, but, and everybody has heard the story. Herb Deutsch has repeated the story so many times that, I mean, everybody knows it. Uh, he described what an envelope was. Bob Moog said, oh, give me a moment. He ran to the hardware store across the street. He bought a doorbell. He brought it back. He wired it into the system. And then whenever you wanted to start and stop a note, instead of droning, you hit the doorbell. Um, so it was the first uh, envelope trigger. Uh, but when you put all that together and you actually start um, creating these instruments, these electronic instruments, a lot of how they're received is informed by, um, by the human interface. And anybody who's talked to me for any amount of time knows that, you know, the thing that interests me most about uh, electronic musical instruments is the human interface, how, how the human being connects with the machine. Um, and Mo's decision was a fateful one because it guided design of synthesizers with, you know, now we're seeing more offshoots, but basically aside from a couple of offshoots, um, we, almost every synthesizer that we think about today is at least partially based on a keyboard paradigm. And if you connect something to the keyboard paradigm, then because of the weight of tradition in the last 200 years or so, you connect it to the piano. And so you have, you know, the grand piano, the electromechanical piano, the Rhodes or the Wurlitzer, and then eventually uh, electronic pianos. You know, people were designing electronic uh, instruments to simulate pianos. And remember, a lot of them, including some famous ones, uh, didn't even have dynamics. They they produced sound at the same volume level. And if you wanted to change volume, you had a, you had a volume pedal. Um, so the punchline of of this is that in the environment where synthesizers were being developed in the 60s and 70s, much as it is today, piano articulation is king, even when it necessarily shouldn't be. And um, that is what's going to take us now into this search, starting in 1970, where people start to think of the synthesizer as a commercial item, 
And this template of piano articulation starts to overlay itself, possibly unnecessarily, on the way these designs went forward. Now, this is a good place for me to stop. If anybody's got questions, please unmute yourself and ask, um, you know, or discussion or telling me I'm full of it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll give a moment. Uh, if anybody has anything, uh, go ahead. Wow, tough crowd. Okay, um, then we'll then we'll move on. Um, uh, the next thing we want to talk about uh, is uh, paraphonic synthesis. Um, we're going to talk about it right now as a uh, a more theoretical thing, which um, I like to refer to as the great enemy. Um, the first of all, I want to I want to mention that. Uh, paraphonic is not a made-up word. Um, it's used a lot now, but it was actually a product name. Uh, in 1978, Roland actually released an organ and strings combo machine, which uh, the RS-505, which was actually called the paraphonic, and the name stuck. Now, um, at the uh, at the dawn of synthesis, you know, we're talking 1970, you know, the advent of the mini Moog through until 74, 75, there was a pretty clear differentiation between uh, synthesizers and whatever else a popular music uh, composer was going to play. Synthesizers were monophonic, and organs, pianos, and eventually string ensembles were polyphonic. And it was all well and good. Um, when you talk about a monophonic synthesizer, your um, your job is actually fairly easy. Uh, you have a triggering system, which uh, opens uh, an envelope uh, that allows a, a VCO, some sort of a vibrating oscillator, to go through a filter, which shapes the tone, which then goes through a VCA um, to shape the loudness. And you put envelopes on it, and you maybe do pulse width modulation or frequency modulation or an LFO or whatever to give it some character. Um, and um, then all you need to worry about is triggering. And this is where the keyboard comes in. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing about, the, um, the thing about uh, a monophonic synthesizer is you read the entire keyboard, you press any key, you close a switch, and your envelopes start, right? The uh, and you can of course have a trigger or a gate coming off of the keyboard, and your articulation is provided by your envelopes. And uh, the uh, as of yet, while people were starting to think about the idea of single and multiple triggering, things like uh, high low note priority just weren't an issue. You played a note, you got a note. Um, now. The other thing which tends to differentiate um, uh, these early instruments like pianos and organs from synthesizers is that pianos and organs, by and large, have what we call full polyphony. Every key on the keyboard is connected to something that makes a sound on its own. Uh, you know, for a piano, you have a hammer, a, ca a, a, a cashment, and a set of two or three strings. For a harpsichord, you have a plectrum. And, uh, and strings under that, et cetera. So, you know, if you were to somehow fall on a, a grand piano keyboard, you'd get 88 notes. Um, synthesizers, obviously, uh, didn't do that, not only because of the economics of trying to build something with full polyphony and the technical challenges, which were in the early 70s, basically insurmountable, but also, um, the fact that they hadn't figured out yet, and keep in mind, you know, this this is this whole not yet thing to yeah, we got it, is the space of about three years, um, which in technological terms is the blink of an eye. So point is that monophonic synthesizers, um, you didn't have to worry about triggering. You, you closed a switch, you got a note. Um, but in the effort to start pushing toward polyphony, you had to figure out a way really to 
trigger more than one note from an electronic keyboard. And that was a bit of a palaver at first. Uh, string machines didn't have any issue because a string machine was basically uh, a form of electric organ. It was, you have a divide down oscillator, which means you have 12 oscillators for the top octave of the keyboard. And then to get the lower octaves, you use frequency dividers to bring them down. You, you cut it in half, you get the next octave down, uh, cut it by a quarter, you get the octave after that. And because frequency generate, uh, dividers are cheap, and easy to build, those 12 oscillators running all the time and being gated by the keys gave you as many octaves as you needed. So again, a string machine had full polyphony, but it was more like an organ than a piano because the individual notes don't have articulation. Um, and um, the, um, at first, the differentiation between um, monophonic synthesizers and polyphonic everything else was a pretty clean one. And I will argue later on in the talk that this is an era. I mean, you know, a lot of good music came out. The electronics began finding their way into popular music. This was the era of, you know, early Genesis. This was the era uh, of prog rock like Genesis, yes, and so forth. This was the era where jazz was starting to experiment. You had people like Sun Ra, who toured with a prototype Mini Moog, actually. Not the Mini Moog Model D, but the Mini Moog Model B. Um, so there was now this sort of ferment of interest. And the, the monophonic synthesizer was considered as a monophonic voice for orchestration. You know, there's nothing wrong with a monophonic instrument. I mean, clarinets are monophonic, trumpets are monophonic. Uh, and this was another instrument in that ensemble. The problem was that a lot of these guys heard these great sounds coming out of the, the synthesizer and they looked at the organ and they said, you know, it'd be nice if I could play chords on a synthesizer. And the minute you do that, you start to overlay this template of tradition. And so you not only want multiple notes, but like a piano, you want each note to have its own particular envelope character. So now you're talking about, once again, articulation. And, uh, oh, uh, any questions so far? Anybody? Um, unmute yourself if necessary. Okay, so as we get into uh, this desire for polyphony that, uh, key that keyboardists start to ask for, this is where um, technology and economics uh, enter the picture. Um, synthesizers are expensive. They are, you know, whether they're hand-wired discrete components or whether they're uh, chips, that have certain elements, modules, uh, you know, collected in one, one batch of silicon. Uh, especially in the early 70s, when solid state technology was really still in its infancy, synthesizers are expensive. An oscillator, an oscillator chip is not cheap. Uh, a filter chip is not cheap. Uh, a VCA is not cheap. And the problem with, um, the problem with polyphony is that if you want to have a true polyphonic instrument, we'll get back to that later, you need to have each voice have the voice structure of a monophonic synthesizer. Every voice you play has to have a BCO, a VCF, and a VCA, and your keyboardist is not gonna be happy if the VCF and the VCA don't have separate um, uh, envelope generators. You need to have an envelope for tone. You need to have an envelope for loudness. Having an envelope for pitch is nice, but that's not something that, that keyboardists tend to worry about too much. So now we get into the issue of the technology of building these instruments. They're, they're big and they're expensive. And you also have the issue now of 
triggering notes in chords. Uh, the uh, one thing worth mentioning, by the way, is that very soon after we had monophonic keyboards, we had duophonic keyboards. It's easy enough to design a keyboard bus bar so that it knows where your low note is and it knows where your high note is. It doesn't know what's going on in the middle, but it knows those. And early instruments like the Arb Odyssey were duophonic. And notice, all you were doing was splitting the VCO, the two VCOs, to two different pitches. It was still a monophonic. Uh, um, signal path after that, and nobody had a problem with it. You know, y yeah, you could you could basically create uh, what were monophonic tones with intervals built in. You could you could play a third, you could play a fifth, octaves, whatever, and um, people didn't have a problem with the fact that those two notes didn't have individual articulation. But as polyphony started to become a matter of interest, triggering and, uh, uh, and separate articulation became a matter of interest too. Um, <coughs> now it's, it's decently well decided that the credit for the first uh, polyphonic synthesizer keyboard that uses what we consider the standard these days, which is a high speed uh, digital scanning that uh, looks for uh, contacts being held down, which are then multiplexed and sent out, you know, to, with control voltages and triggers to a certain number of outside synths. That was created by Dave Rossum of EMU Systems. And uh, during a visit to EMU, uh, Dave's friend, Tom Oberheim, uh, saw the system and said, you know, this is really intriguing and i i have a synthesizer ready to go i have the, the sem which was basically created to connect to a mini moog uh and give it give it more guts um as if a mini moog needed more guts but that's another story uh i have these things and if i were to figure out a way to combine them with one of these digital scanning keyboards i could actually create a truly polyphonic uh, synthesizer. And that's where the Oberheim two voice and four voice and eight voice came from. And that was 1970, I wanna say 74 uh, or thereabouts. And um, the, uh, so what happened with that first polyphonic synthesizer was it established a lot of ideas, some of which were not popular, some of which were. Um, people think of it as being truly polyphonic, but the fact is what it was, was it was truly multi-timbral. Every single voice in an eight voice could have its own timbre. Uh, you could program them. It would remember the settings of all the potentiometers, but it wasn't fully programmable because a couple of the pots you didn't remember and it couldn't remember switch positions. So if you were doing things like selecting the, the uh, filter mode um, and you wanted all the voices to be band pass, you had to click it out of, out of uh, that position. Uh, it represented a way forward because of course, as anybody who's ever played uh, uh, an Oberheim Poly knows, you hit a chord on that thing and it's pretty darn impressive. Uh, they, 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 they pack a real punch. And keyboardists who are in a position to afford spending five, six thousand dollars for a synthesizer were really pretty thrilled by this, which is why you see them on early period Rush albums, because Getty Lee was a fan. You hear them on Moody Blues records and uh, Yes albums when Patrick Moraz was playing because he was a big fan. And there were any number of other people. The, these instruments, they got a lot of exposure. Uh, they were on a lot of LPs that fans and up-and-coming musicians would read the liner notes on. And this whole idea of a polyphonic synthesizer was a big damn deal. And so there was this sort of emphasis on, well, it's not really a polyphonic synthesizer unless it gives us that kind of articulation. The problem is most companies can't survive on only selling $8,000 instruments. You want something that your average punter who's 
put together a rig and wants something to augment his piano or his electric piano and his organ, and it needs to be within reach. Uh, you know, a dollar bought a lot more back then. These days, we, we sort of quail at the thought of an $8,000 synthesizer. And in 1974, uh, uh, an $8,000 synthesizer was a big damn deal. You could, you could buy, easily buy a good car for that and put a down payment on a house, really. Um, thank God for most of these musicians, it was the era of big labels and album deals where you could get an advance in the tens of thousands of dollars. So you could go out and get this stuff. But what about the guy who's at home? What about the guy who, who's, you know, he's gigging, he's driving around, he's doing stuff, he's playing weddings, he's playing event houses, he plays bars. Where does he get his polyphony from? And maybe a string section doesn't really feel worthwhile. Um, but you, you have this expectation that's there. And, you know, the expectation only got worse later in 1975 when Yamaha came out with the GX1, which is a whole story in and of itself. The GX1, the GX1 is an outlier in almost any way you can classify synthesizers. There, there quite literally was nothing like it before and nothing like it after. And no, the CS80 does not count. They're actually very different instruments. That having been said, uh, the punchline of this is that while engineers were struggling to build instruments with any kind of polyphony, keyboardists, a lot of them had already decided that fully polyphonic instruments required articulation. And if you didn't have articulation in a keyboard, that was bad. That was not desirable. Uh, again, a good place to stop. Questions? Answers? Uh, hey, Mike. It's Mike yeah. Hunter. Yeah, hi, I, Mike. I, I noticed you neglected to mention Bukla, who's... who's uh, that is... That paradigm. Was, <laughs> yeah, and Bukla's paradigm, well, again, I have to say, and that, that's, by the way, a good omission. It, I actually was supposed to put it in my notes, and I didn't. Uh, I, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if you came in before I started talking about Moog and Herb Deutsch deciding that a keyboard was the way to go forward and make the synthesizer more accessible to more people. Buchla did, in fact, take the opposite tack, and we know whose synthesizers define the market. Exactly. Uh, he, was, he was there, and he was doing this stuff, and he didn't stop until he died, but let's face it, he wasn't exactly Mr. Popularity. There's a reason why uh, the name Buchla is not a household word. Um, so yeah, that's a very valid point. And I'll actually come back to that a little bit toward the end. Um, yeah, you, you surfaced the, the thing that I was, was thinking of is yep, that, yep. you know, keyboards, synthesizers popularity probably wouldn't have been as great it as it was if it wasn't it, for keyboards. It wouldn't have happened at all. Yeah, probably not. It, you know, if both Don Buchla and Bob Moog had decided to put these things out without familiar keyboards on them, the synthesizer, as we know, it would have been relegated to history. It would have just been an academic laboratory machine for making noises. Exactly. And it might never have proceeded beyond that. So that was the, um, that was the, uh, um, a, a fateful choice. And it had both good and bad repercussions. And Dave, should I be worried that you just pulled your mic boom down into range? You look like you were like cocking a machine gun there, getting ready to jump in on this. Should I worry? Wow, that's some really good hum, baby. Oh. Yeah, I think that's a synth. That's a synth. Mute, mute yourself until you figure it out, Dave. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you'll figure it out at some point. Gotta love old hardware. Um, so anything else or we're going to start moving forward into some of the practical applications, some of the hands-on stuff? Okay. Uh, part three, uh, paraphony and the era of not quite there yet. The era of not quite there yet ranged from about 1974 to about uh, 1978. Uh, and this is where we really start to see people trying to work out solutions to this 
very complicated balance of technology and expense and capability. Um, the, uh, if you look at a polyphonic synthesizer um, using what at the time were sort of the conventional chips, you know, you would have AVCO, you would have AVCF, you would have AVCA. Um, a monophonic synthesizer has three chips or maybe four if you've got two VCOs. If you want to build something like that as a four voice polyphonic synthesizer, you now need 12 chips four oscillators, four filters, four uh, amplifiers. And if you want to have two VCOs on a voice, then you add four more chips. Now you're talking 16. You're talking, you have quadrupled the number of chips, right? Four voices, four chips per voice, 16 voices. You've quadrupled the cost of the instrument and you have quadrupled the heat output. So these instruments, you now suddenly have to start thinking uh, not only about keyboard scanning and single and multiple triggering and high low last priority uh, and voice stealing, but you also have to think about the fact that what had been a couple of circuit boards with you know some discrete components or a few chips are now starting to get complicated. And uh, the nice thing about a paraphonic synthesizer is that you can have multiple oscillators. Um, and uh, if you play some tricks, you can get those multiple oscillators to run through a single filter and a single amplifier. And what you can get is an overall articulation like a piano, but inside that articulation, you have individual pitches coming and going as they would on a pipe organ. So essentially you have an envelope, which is either single triggered or multiple triggered. So, you know, every time you hit a key, it re-triggers or whatever. And inside those envelopes, you can have uh, different pitches. And if you use uh, a divide down uh, oscillator, top octave oscillator, a set of 12 oscillators covers as many notes on the keyboard as you want to play. So what that means is if you have 12 oscillators doing the divide down network and then one VCF and one VCA and two envelopes, you're talking about um, 14 oscillators and, and, and two envelopes to control as many keys as you can slap on the damn thing. You know, the ARP Omni was 48, 49 keys. The Selena was 49 keys, uh, and so on. You could have a as chord structures as big as you wanted, but you sacrificed the piano-like articulation. And to people who were raised on piano sounds, that sounded wrong. It sounded like something was missing, something was broken. And uh, with that in mind, the the people who were creating these paraphonic synthesizers and some of them were, were were pretty amazing they kept getting pushback from the people who were buying these instruments saying that they weren't the real thing um so uh some classic um uh examples um are um the uh uh we'll, we'll go through a couple um the problem was that it was very quickly determined with instruments like the ARP String Ensemble, AKA the eminent Selena, AKA the eminent uh, string section of the, the, the 310 uh, organ from 1972, which is where this whole thing started. Um, and thanks to Jean-Michel Jarre, people remember that um, because nothing sounds like an eminent through a small stone phaser, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, the you had different ways of strategizing, getting this kind of polyphony out to people in ways that they could sort of hold their noses and swallow it. Um, in the case of ARP, um, their technique was to hide it. So what you would have with instruments like the orchestral keyboards, the Omni and the Omni 2, you would have not only a string synth, 
but you'd also squeeze in there, you know, so you got your 14 oscillators, but then you'd squeeze in another two to four and you would add in other parts. So you would have a monophonic bass synth and a monophonic lead synth or a monophonic, uh, you know, something else, melody synth or whatever you wanted to call it. And if you set up your keyboard triggering right, you could sort of fool the listener into hearing the articulation of the bass line and the lead line and the chord structure that was doing the rest of it, um, you could sort of forgive it a little more. That's why the Omni and the Omni 2 were such incredibly popular keyboards, because instead of just being string synthesizers, you had not only extra parts for your orchestrations, but those extra parts made the string and brass sounds somehow sound more legitimate. Now, um, the one instrument I'm going to spend the most time on uh, is um, the, uh, the way Moog wanted to approach this problem, which is to work within it. And uh, that, of course, means we're talking about the Polymoog. Uh, in 1975, uh, Paul, uh, Dave Luce designed uh, a, a, a truly polyphonic instrument. And the, the Polymoog had a different kind of a voice structure than other instruments at the time. Under certain circumstances, you could define it as a truly polyphonic synthesizer. Uh, it broke down a lot of barriers. It was the first synthesizer to have a 71 note keyboard. It was the first uh, synthesizer to have a velocity sensitive keyboard. Um, and uh, it was the, the first synthesizer that used a basic uh, VC, VCO, VCF, VCA structure that was fully polyphonic. Now, the trick is um, you started with a divide down network. Uh, so you had the, the VCOs where you had 12 of them and they were being moved down the, down the keyboard appropriately. But you then had for each note, you had a VCF and VCA on each key. And one of those, I believe it was the VCA, had an envelope attached to it. All the envelopes were programmed globally. They weren't very exciting envelopes, but you could actually create uh, some articulation for these, um, for these envelopes. And the various presets that the Polymoog had, which was a, a very new idea, um, were actually preset selections of parameters for the filters, the VCAs, and the envelopes. So when you punched one of those eight buttons, you got a particular type of sound, which you could then tweak using the front panel controls, of which there were many. Uh, so under those circumstances, you could say that when you were using one of the presets, the, uh, the Polymog was truly polyphonic. Um, however, if you wanted to program it and change the VCF dynamics into something other than what was under every key, you only had one low pass filter and all 71 voices were run through it. And a lot of people felt that since you only had a divide down network, and by the way, for a divide down network, if you don't have a chorus or something like that attached, um, all of the notes are in phase. And as a result, um, you, uh, it sounds much thinner than you think it would. And so you started with that and then your only real, you know, I can play with the, the cutoff and resonance filter was a single one that everything ran through. People just sort of threw up their hands and said, well, it's not really a polyphonic synthesizer at all. And, you know, we'll ignore the fact that it had 71 voice cards, 142 chips, and uh, its failure rate was approximately 200%. Uh, on average, if you bought a Polymoog, you could expect it to fail at least twice in its lifetime. Um, so, you know, they were horrifically unreliable. They generated an enormous amount of heat. I actually had a, a music colleague who was on my first album who owned a Polymoog and he kept it in his basement and he kept it turned on so it would stay in tune. 
uh, and it heated his house. It was an extraordinarily, uh, you know, heat sink the size of what you'd expect on, uh, I don't know what, uh, industrial machinery. Um, but all of that aside, the fact is that people who were looking for real, true, articulated polyphony were disappointed by it. And um, and this is a place where, by the way, I have to sort of take issue with my, my, my dear friend and colleague, Gordon Reed. I know most of you will know who he is. He is a, uh, a writer in England who has a phenomenally large synthesizer collection and an encyclopedic knowledge of each of them based on playing them and offer, often repairing them. Uh, and the, when Gordon wrote about this phase of, of Moog's history, um, the way he phrased it was very negative. He, he, and this is a quote. He said, despite the Poly Moog's problems, and this, by the way, is from Sound on Sound magazine, June 1998. You can find it on um, uh, recreated, uh, optically scanned on Sound on Sound's own website. Uh, but what he said was, Despite the polymogue's problems, Dave Luce defended his design resolutely, implying when interviewed that players simply didn't understand his creation. He said, quote, the criticisms that have emerged just don't address the basic question at all. And my argument is that he was right. Uh, the polymogue demanded a different playing style and a different playing expectation from the player. If you heard it in the hands of people like Herbie Hancock or Michael Boddicker, uh, who has become a good friend and uh, who was one of the original product demonstrators, you can actually find a 12 or 13 minute Polymo demo video on YouTube where Mike Boddicker uh, runs it through its paces. And it's fascinating because you get a really good idea of what this machine was supposed to be. But what everybody expected was 71 mini Moogs. And, you know, do the math. Uh, you know, almost a thousand ships. And it wasn't gonna happen. Uh, and as it was, it was expensive. It was $5,000, $1975, so. Uh, and and so the the problem was that that instruments like the Omni and the Polymog sort of they 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 weren't really able to establish their own paradigm, and because they didn't fit the paradigm of piano players, uh, they got they got dissed a lot. Um, and before we go on again, a good place to stop. Uh, unmute yourself if you have a question or a comment. So two things. Um, yes. One, I work with a guy named Ben Luce at MEAP. He's the son of David. Son Luce. of Dave. And uh, amazing guy. Yeah, he is. Um, standing in front of a polymog and discussing it, I found out something that is widely misunderstood. The polymog is not, in fact, a divide down synthesizer. Really? Yeah, <laughs> it's like widely misunderstood. Um, that yeah, it, it actually isn't. I, I encourage you to reach him, reach out to him, and talk about that because I don't well, do you have do you have a, 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 a like a one sentence pressy because it's um, it's not vital to my talk, but you know. So how were because th there were not VCOs per key. So yeah, I'll, how... I'll, I'll find I'll find out. Okay, because uh, we you. talked about this. I don't just don't remember the specifics. Also, there were two versions of the Polymog. Yeah, the Polymog keyboard, which came later. Yeah, the, um, one of them, I think the initial one, the 203A, actually yeah. did give you some articulation. Um, yeah, it did. And that was the point. If you used the presets, you actually got very nice articulation, but everybody wanted the dynamically controllable VCF. And there was only one of those. And that was what upset everybody. Um, the Polymode 201A has um, one? an envelope. Uh, yeah, one envelope. Yes. Okay. Now I see. One VCF. One VCF. Dynamically yeah. controlled envelope. Correct. Yep. So, um, but thank you for pointing that out about the VCOs, and that is something I'm going to have to go back and look at. Isn't it a good thing that the Polymog isn't in the first volume of these books? Mm, yeah, I guess that's good luck, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it got set aside because there was a lot of controversy there. Um, moving on. Um, any other questions, comments before I, I go on? Anybody? There was a comment in chat 
Um, hang on a moment. I'll pop open my chat window. Uh, I assume uh, paraffiny uh, will come up sooner or later. That's what we're in the middle of, Steve. Uh, you're holding it wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, and Simon yet yeah, points out it would be unusable in a mix. That is that is very true. And one of the things Rick Wakeman is famously quoted as saying, just because they give you 71 notes doesn't mean you're supposed to be playing 71 notes at one time. Um, the musicality of paraphonic synthesizers was uh, only slightly understood by some people. And so, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, other comments before we move on? Yeah, I'm going to expand on that, Mike. I think, you know, from my sophomore experiment in the last six years, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that was great about the music of the 70s is the very lack of polyphonic synthesizers. Aha! In yes, you jumping, had, you had jumping the gun on one of my final rose, points. The string, the Selena, but they were all thin and they meshed together in a mix. And then when you stuck a mini Moog, three oscillator brass lead line on top, it stood out. And now, if, you know, unless you know what you're doing, and I think Dave Stewart, ex of Bruford and National Health, oh, yes. is one of the very few people who knows how to do this. He knows how to blend polyphonic chords on a two or three oscillator polyphonic synthesizer with the rest of the mix. But you, you I mean, you, get, you can do this yourself, right? Get the Arturia Mini V, make it four voice polyphonic, three oscillators by four voices, 12 oscillators, hit a chord on that, it blasts everything else into oblivion. Yes. Yeah. And, and that is something actually which I'll be talking about in a little bit. My, my apologies. <laughs> no, quite all right. It's a good point, and I'm very glad that folks are starting to think in that direction. Um, so now, chapter four is called True Polyph, pardon my language, and the Twilight of the Paraphonic Synth. Um, in 1975, we got the Yamaha GX1. It was a true polyphonic synthesizer, and it was a monster. The, just to understand how they built these things, the fact that they built more than one was something of a miracle. Uh, it was followed by the, Yama, the Yamaha CS80 in 1978, uh, and then of uh, 77, and then in 78, we had the Sequential Prophet 5. And keyboardists all over the world have a collective orgasm. Finally, we have real polyphony, whatever the heck that is. Um, there were some last gasps of uh, the paraphonic design, um, uh, specifically into wit. Um, we had, for instance, the, uh, the polymode keyboard, which was mentioned before. Um, it was just as failure prone as the original polymode, and the memory mode was still four years away. Moog definitely. That's another story. The Moog history you could talk about for days and days and days. Um, but ARP put out the Omni 2, and the Omni 2 was actually a pretty significant advance over the Omni uh, because they, uh, they had, again, the two mono synths and the string machine, but they greatly improved the single and multiple triggering, and they added a better envelope to the bass. So you got much closer to a polyphonic synthesizer uh, uh, feel than you did. Um, and uh, ARP also uh, built Quadra, which was more of the same. You had uh, four sections. There was a string section, a polysynth section, which, was, which, which had a different voice structure, but devised its original sound from the same divide down network as the strings. But then you also had a monophonic bass synth, which was a real synth. And you had a duophonic lead synth. And when you add in pressure sensitivity and, and layering and splits, you actually got a pretty cool instrument. But it wasn't a Prophet 5, and it came out in the same year. And again, by the time ARP got the Chroma halfway built, they were in bankruptcy. And uh, the, the story goes on from there to, to, to Rhodes, et cetera. Um, but what was interesting was out of all these manufacturers, there was one whose last gasps weren't really last gasps, and that's Korg. 
in 1977 and 1978, they came out with three synthesizers, the PS synthesizers, the 3100, the 3300, and then later the 3200, which was programmable. Um, they do use divide down uh, VCOs, but uh, they are not paraphonic. The voice structure of one of these voices, uh, we'll take the 3100, is you do have a divide down oscillator network, but um, the uh, it's fed through individual filters with individual VCAs, and there is articulation of a sort on both. So what you're talking about here is a machine that is effectively uh, as, uh, as polyphonic, you know, 48 keys, 48 notes, because you have one of these networks for each note. Um, and it, it worked somewhat like the polymo, but it had just that little bit more articulation to really convince uh, people that what they were hearing was a genuinely polyphonic synthesizer. And people argued, yeah, but well, you don't have multiple VCOs, so it's kind of thin sounding. And their response was to say, okay, fine, we'll build a box with two or three of them that you trigger with every note, which is what the 3300 was. The 3300 had 144 voice cards. Uh, it was an astounding feat of over engineering. Uh, and it sounded phenomenal and it had you know certain advantages because you're because you're uh you've got 12 oscillators and they're being reproduced for every octave you get to do things like messing with temperaments you can create stretch tunings you can experiment with weird octaves and, and that sort of thing because you only had to do it for one octave and then all the other octaves would work i mean the, the 30 the, the 3000 series the ps3000 series are just the most over-engineered brute force polyphonic synthesizers ever built. They sound gorgeous. Um, Bob Moog even said that for, for really fat pad type sounds, it beat anything he his company had ever built. Um, but they were, you know, very expensive and uh, very complicated. Um, then later on, uh, as uh, digital control started becoming uh, uh, popular, Korg released a one of these three machines in one thing, like the Omni, um, the um, which was the Trident, and in particular the Trident Mark II uh, from 1982. The Trident was 1980. It was it had a string and brass synthesizer, which was basically divide down. But it also had a real polyphonic synthesizer in it with eight voices and, you know, uh, eight VCO sets, eight uh, VCFs, eight uh, VCAs, and one ADSR that controlled the VCA. And people complained that the Trident, you know, wasn't really polyphonic because it only had that one envelope. So the Trident Mark II came out and they put in another envelope on every voice. So it really was an eight voice, truly polyphonic synthesizer with a divide down string machine in there. And a fairly remarkable machine that people are only starting to recognize as being really a, a very worthwhile piece because Cord did not do a very good job of marketing it. They, you know, because so many people had talked about truly polyphonic synthesizers that were actually paraphonic string machines that, that uh, the audience was jaded and they didn't really understand that this, this was the real McCoy. Um, and then later on, of course, in, um, in um, uh, 1984 ish, you have the Korg Poly 800. And the Poly 800 was the first uh, under $1,000 uh, polyphonic synthesizer. And, you know, people who were around then remembered that that $1,000 mark was a target that everybody was driving for for years, way before MIDI came along. Since about 1981, where we started getting more affordable uh, polyphonic analog synths, everybody was saying, when are they going to get under $1,000? When are they going to get under $1,000? And um, the, uh, the Poly 800 managed it. And the way they did it was they had uh, uh, eight oscillators 
and one filter and one envelope, uh, excuse me, one filter and one amplifier. But the trick is the envelopes were placed on the VCOs before the filter. And the filter had its own envelope and the VCA had its own envelope, but there were also envelopes on each one of the oscillators. So you could layer uh voices to get four voices with two oscillators you could play it with only one oscillator and get eight voice polyphony but you got a lot of the sense of a polyphonic synth with comparatively little expenditure and that's why the poly 800 came along and it was not only it wasn't like 999.99 it was 795 it was an 800 synthesizer and it was a long time before anybody was able to hit that with an analog design that was more polyphonic than that. Um, so when we get to this point, now we're in 1979, 1980, we're starting to move into the era of more affordable polyphonic analog synthesizers. And basically string machines fade away, paraphonic synths are left to gather dust. Um, and um, the um you know and and what's interesting is um keyboardists they go on and on and on about how they want full polyphony but realistically when the prophet five came out they were so happy to have individual articulation of each voice that the fact that there were only four five voices didn't really bother them very much and so what you end up with is these you know, piano paradigm people who somehow are fine with having only five, six, eight voices, 10 for the profit 10, and it never bothers them. So what we end up here is, you know, the piano tyrants win, win the war, but they screw themselves in the process. And that was the State of the Union until 1983, of course, when the Yamaha DX7 came out and along with giving people 16 voices of fully articulated polyphony it ruined synthesis forever but that's uh again um a uh a subject for another talk uh, i'm going to take a moment to look at comments uh in chat and then um we will uh take questions so give me a moment here um yeah somebody mentions full bucket they are actually making some very very nice uh synthesizer models um and uh they're free which is amazing uh so i recommend i recommend fullbucket.de they're they're really wonderful little plugins uh dave fulton i remember what i wanted to say before zoom hijacked a prefader bus on my uad interface uh surge and Paya tried to popularize uh cheap polyphony um but they did crappy jobs yes that is that is very true um although surge wasn't cheap uh and uh yeah we're uh we're caught up now uh anybody want to unmute ask more questions before we wrap up and, and and move on to a sort of uh i'll talk a little bit about my book and we'll get to sort of a general question and answer kind of a thing majora yeah i'm going to jump in i'm going to go back to where we we left off last time so polyphony is so full polyphony is so rich compared to everything except acoustic instruments i guess where do you see it being most useful in a mix like with in a song we have multiple parts synth music typically you know we have a whole bunch of different instruments well the Where um, would you say do and don't use you know polyphonic triads or even even larger chords um i would argue that in almost no case is uh really heavy polyphonic playing the province of analog synthesis i really believe that unless you're talking about single oscillator divide down which has a very natural sense of space in it which yeah. is why you could do block chords on a string machine and not yeah, really yeah, mix yeah. um the uh i would say that the dx7 was really and this was what everybody wanted the dx7 was a synth you could just play like a damn piano Mm. and and as i said it ruined everything um so uh i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as i wrap up uh any other questions okay so what have we learned we've learned that pianists are jerks 
Um, we've learned that, uh, and I'm kidding, by the way, um, we've learned that musicians do not care about technical limitations. They want what they want. And that is not always a bad thing. Uh, because if, uh, if all the keyboardists who wanted what a piano could give had simply compromised, we wouldn't have seen all of this amazing, amazing technology. Um, we've learned that engineers are clever about getting rid of tech, uh, getting around tech limitations, and they produce great machines, even if they're not what pianists think they want. Um, in thinking about paraphonic synths as poor substitutes for polyphonics, we miss the point of what they can and do accomplish. Uh, in my opinion, Dave Luce was right. People who uh, uh, dumped on the polymog because it wasn't 71 uh, mini mogs uh, in a box um, didn't get the idea. But the people who did were people like Michael Boddicker, Tony Banks, uh, Keith Emerson, Rick Wakeman, Gary Newman, and many, many other people who took these paraphonic instruments and used them for what they were best at. And by the way, Gary Newman was famous for playing the polymog. He mostly played it monophonically. It was, um, it was not a, uh, 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 something that he played block chords on. Cars, all the stuff on the pleasure principle, that was mostly monophonic and duophonic lines because he understood that you could bury your mixes in sludge and it didn't, it didn't help you. People often don't remember that Gary started out as a punk musician. He was a punk guitarist, and he um, he created a punk band called the Two Way Army, which eventually he started adding electronics to. And he learned from the get go that you could only push analog synthesis so far before you drowned out everything else. So you know th these people understood how to use these machines. And th sort of the last point I want to make is. Um, Moog picked the keyboard because it was cheap, it was convenient, and it would build instruments. But at the time, he acknowledged what Don Buchla said, which was that somewhere down the line, it was going to force compromises. And in my opinion, and this is sort of the thought I'd like to leave you with, I think that, that because of this constant push toward piano-style polyphony, um, there has been a lack of legitimacy, I guess you'd say, for the playing styles that we saw in the early 70s, where the analog synthesizer was treated as a monophonic instrument like the clarinet. You know, nobody has any problems with a clarinet requiring both hands to play and only being able to play one note at a time, right? Same with the trumpet. You know, a monophonic instrument is a monophonic instrument. You write for it, you articulate for it, you keep in mind what it can do in the context of other polyphonic instruments, and it is what it is. And that's why when people ask me, you know, what my background is, is it organ, is it piano, I say it's neither. I am a mini mode player. Um, I have very poor hand independence, and I always have, um, and I am happiest with my right hand playing monophonic lines and my left hand doing the occasional uh, uh, figured bass, but otherwise resting on the controls. You know, my natural way of playing is melody and simple chord structures with one hand. And there was a lot of that that produced a lot of interesting, well-orchestrated music in the 70s that gradually got drained away as it became affordable for your average keyboardist to have a stack of three or four digital sample-based workstations, each one of which had 128 note polyphony. I mean, what the actual, guys? You know, if you're not doing a Hollywood soundtrack, who needs that many voices? So this whole idea of the synthesizer, you know, and, and of course, people talk about, well, you know, but there's, there's no nuance, there's no variation. You know, an oboe is played differently than a, a bassoon, which is played differently than a clarinet, which is played differently than a bass clarinet, to which I respond, yeah, 
And a mini Moog is not played the same way as an Odyssey, is not played the same way as a Roland SH-3A, is not played the same way as a multi Moog, is not played the same way as an Art Pro Soloist. You know, these instruments have variations on technique, and that's what makes them special. Somebody who gets really good on one of these monophonic instruments makes it their own. Eddie Jobson playing a mini Moog does not sound like Dave Stewart playing a mini Moog. Keith, uh, Keith Emerson playing a mini Moog does not sound like Rick Wakeman playing a mini Moog. One of the classic examples of this, and I'm going to urge you to go and find a copy if you don't already own it, uh, the prog group Camel did an album called I Can See Your House From Here. And um, the first track, Wait, in the instrumental break after the second verse, um, there are dueling mini Moog solos. And the first and third are Kit Watkins, who of Happy the Man, who some of you will probably have heard of. And I'm blanking on the name of the guy who did the second and fourth. He was a Dutch gentleman. Um, I want to say Ton Scherpenzale, but he was later. But anyway, the point is, these two guys are playing their mini Moogs set up the way they like a mini Moog to sound. And the... The Kit Watkins, if you've ever heard anything he's done, any of his solo albums, anything by Happy the Man, you go, that's Kit. That's Kit. And the other gentleman had his own timbre, which was very different. And the call and response was marvelous because Kit's timbre set up each of the 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 breaks. And then um, the, the Dutch gentleman, I'm going to have to look it up. It's going to drive me crazy. Uh, I want to Bart Strollenberg. A anyway, he had this much more gutsy, distorted sound, overdriven sound that would slam things in to the next round. Uh, so it was a uh, Jan Schellhaas. Thank you, thank you, Simon. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Jan had a had a much more energetic, much tougher sound. And so my argument is that we have, in some sense, lost that under a welter of, um, frankly, polyphonic instruments that are way too polyphonic. Um, I am not interested in machines that have, you know, that much polyphony and that much guts per voice because, in fact, as Simon said, they steamroller things. The only company that ever built an eight-voice, po fully polyphonic analog synthesizer that sat well in a mix, in my opinion, was Roland with the Jupiter 8. One of the reasons why everybody sneered at the Jupiter 8 at the time, because it was so thin sounding compared to a profit, but it was used on gazillions of hits, is because it blended into a mix. It blended into a mix. There was something about the character of the chips in the Jupiter 8 that just worked. And when Roland stepped away from making its own voice chips and started using Curtis, that quality was lost. That is why the Super Jupiter MKS-80 sounds like a Jupiter 6 and not like a Jupiter 8, even though it has eight voices, because the guts of what made the, the Jupiter 8 so silky was gone. So I'm going to leave you guys with the thought that, you know, when you look at these instruments, don't just contemplate Mo Betta. Contemplate, um, their, um, contemplate their roles. Contemplate the music. It is very, very easy for, for uh, Poindexters to get totally lost in the, uh, in, in the tech and forget that it's all technically supposed to serve the art. And um, I have a problem with that personally. Um, what I've noticed in the last 10 years is the fewer instruments I have, the more music I generate. And I have been more productive in the last five years than in the 35 plus years of my career before that by a big margin. Um, so I guess what I'm really getting to is when we look back at these paraphonic synthesizers from that decade, um, we shouldn't sneer at them. We should realize that like string machines and electric pianos and organs and, and even the grand piano, 
They're instruments in and of their own accord, and they really do require their own their own uh, uh, playing technique. So um, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to uh, open uh, for Q and A one more time. Then I'm going to talk about my book a little bit, and then sort of throw the floor open to whatever people want to ask me about. So anybody uh, anybody on Q and A yet? I'll throw a comment out there. Sure. Right that was a realization that I had, and I'm sure many other years I've had over the years, is that limitation breeds creativity. Yes. Limitation yes. makes you think, well, I have a problem here. How do I solve it? And new things are born of that. Yep. And I was incredibly productive for the first two years that I had uh, uh, an electronic music studio of my own. I had a, um, an Oberheim expander, I had a Roland MC202 uh, and a TR707 drum machine. And they were synced via uh, Roland DIN sync. Uh, and there was MIDI in there and uh, CVs and gates. And I used the hell out of that system. I wrote a ton of music on that system. But then I fell into the gas trap. And I started adding synths and adding synths and adding synths. And I um, am ashamed to admit it, but I literally lost more than a decade. And I recorded in that time 17 minutes of music. And the rest of the time I was rearranging my studio, buying and selling synthesizers and always looking for the next thing. And when I got past that, um, yeah, the music just started flowing. So um, on the topic of synthesizers and music, let me just tell you guys a little bit about my, uh, about my, uh, my book. I'm going to put a link in here in chat. Keeping it very simple. Um, for the next little while, um, I'm going to be on the top of the first, first page of Bukes. Um, Synth Gems 1 is now available for sale in Europe, and it go, it, it, you can pre-order it now, uh, and it goes on sale in the rest of the world on November 1st, I hope. As I said, I don't have a copy. I would love to see it. Um, it's a 320-page book, and the easiest way to describe it is um, if you've ever been to an art museum, you go to an art gallery exhibit, so maybe there's this traveling exhibit of uh, the life of Monet or, you know, uh, Mondrian in a particular period of his work, or Soviet suprematist art. When you leave the gallery, when you leave the exhibit, they funnel you through the gift shop. And, you know, you can pick up your, your Monet baseball cap and your Monet tea cozy and your Monet greeting cards. But at the center of any of these gift shops, there's always going to be something called the exhibition catalog, which is this big book hardbound, beautiful. Every exhibit item is shown, sometimes from several angles, in beautiful museum quality photographs, and there's text about what you're looking at and what its context and its history are. And what, so basically you're able to take a little bit of the feel of the exhibit home with you so that you can enjoy it at your leisure. And basically, Synth Gems 1 is a highly annotated 320 page exhibition catalog for an exhibition of beautiful synthesizers. Synthesizers that may or may not have been milestones. Some of them are vanishingly small rarities, but which in their own way are visually beautiful. So you have, uh, and a lot of them are, are, are you know, bizarre. A lot of them are things where I've had people say, why is that in there? But this other one isn't. And I'm happy to talk about that um, here if people are curious about things. There are 60 synthesizers covering the era from 1970 to 2000. We begin with the Mini Moog, the Model A, and big ups to EMIAP for uh, providing us with gorgeous photographs of the Model A, B, and C in addition to the Model D. Um, and it ends in the year 2000 with the Elisa Andromeda. 
And in there, we talk a lot about uh, some of these uh, paraphonic instruments I've discussed. The Polymog is not in volume one. Uh, it was written up, but uh, we were not able to find one that was in uh, photographable condition. All of the instruments that appear in this book are immaculate, absolutely immaculate. They're in perfect condition. And uh, they come from, and also, by the way, this, this fictional exhibition could never exist in real life because we've pulled instruments from three different museums. So there's uh, SMAM in Freeburg. There's uh, about an hour and a half away in a small town in um, Switzerland, whose name escapes me at the moment, is Syntharama. And then, of course, in Philadelphia, there's Amiap. And uh, the uh, photographs in Switzerland were taken by an amazing photographer named Peter Marr, with Kim assisting him. And the folks in Amiap, I have to give a huge shout out to Drew Raison and his crew taking pictures there, because Kim couldn't be there. He, he you know, pandemic. And he forced those guys to go through so many iterations of the pictures they took to get them perfect. And the team <laughs> never complained once. Well, not publicly. <laughs> no, no, you know what? And, and But they never complained to us. I'm and, only kidding. I'm only kidding. Yeah, but, but Mike, the work that they produced was on par in virtually every yeah I, I can tell you they spent a long time working on that i know it was a huge project for them and we can never thank them enough um when i come finally get out there to do a seminar in person at emmy app i'm taking the entire staff out for for a, a serious dinner um and uh you know uh it'll be on my nickel and i'll be happy to do it because those guys made 20 percent of this book so um you know, big, big shout outs to them. And uh, the book uh, is very heavily researched. It's, it's designed to be a reference. Uh, there's a lot of crap on the internet uh, about synthesizers. And there's stuff that people assume is true that is either mistaken or outright lies. And this book has been intensely uh, 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 refereed. Um, I had Gordon Reed working on it. I had Chris Meyer, whom some of you may know from learningmodular.com, the author of Patch and Tweak, um, looking over it. Uh, Paul Nagel popped his head in on a couple of things and, and gave us some advice. Uh, Peter Marr actually is uh, also a synth expert and synth collector. He's one of the guys who's contributed to this amazing blog website called greatsynthesizers.com, which I strongly recommend. And then um, on a lot of the paraphonic stuff and the educational stuff that comes at the beginning and end of the book, which I'll talk about in a moment, was Mark Doty. And many of you know the name of Mark Doty. Uh, he is a big proponent of understanding paraphonic synthesis for what it is rather than what it isn't. And really understanding the roles of these instruments and how they're used. But the fact is, Mark is a genius on this stuff and people should be listening to him and a lot of what i do in this book and talking about these paraphonic instruments is to take these kinds of arguments that mark has been making for years and years and put them in a format that everybody can um understand and hopefully relate to um we open the book with an educational pressy called the synthesizer and introduction where we teach you everything you need to know about analog synthesizers in six pages. Uh, we have to do that because this book is not only being uh, uh, sent out to um, music tech fans, but we've actually, uh, because it is a museum quality coffee table book, we've been getting a lot of attention from fine arts magazines. Uh, and magazines that look at paintings and sculptures. Because really what this is, is a sculpture gallery where the sculptures are synthesizers. And we just have some amazing instruments in there and they all have amazing stories, each and every one of them. Uh, it was a labor of love, it nearly killed me. Um, I was, uh, my, my wife and daughter were actually really afraid that I was gonna have a heart attack or an aneurysm before this book shipped toward the end. I was doing 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and I was sleeping when I could. But I am incredibly proud of how it came out. And the people who have advised us, every single synth 
that has a living person who worked on it, they got to read and sign off on what was written. For the mini Moog, we I spent three hours with Jim Scott, the head of the mini Moog design team. And he and I, you, you know how intimidating it is to be arguing over a schematic with Jim Scott? Oh, yep. <laughs> my God. Yeah, Actually, you would do. know. <laughs> you, would, you would know, Mike. But, you know, and, and having discussions with Marcus Ryle, the guy who invented the Oberheim Expander, with Tom Oberheim himself, with Dave Smith, with Niall Steiner on the Synthicon, um, just these amazing people. And, uh, you know, and techs and people who worked on them. The, the guy who keeps Jean-Michel Jarre's Eminent 310 working was the guy who fact-checked uh, the piece on the Eminent because I got a very nice letter back from Eminent, which is still in business and doing just fine. And they said, that's so far back that we have no records. And, you know, every machine that appears in there, I did my absolute level best. And uh, not only are you going to learn the names of people who have never gotten credit, um, one that comes to mind immediately is Bill Mouchley, who was the guy who designed the Ensonic Mirage and the ESQ-1 and the EPS and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. He was the idea man at Ensonic for their first several years. Um, and but each of these people also made it a real point. The famous ones made it a point to call out the folks that never get credit. Chris Meyer fact checked my stuff on the Prophet VS because everybody knows that Chris invented the Prophet VS. Well, he didn't, he invented vector synthesis, that's true. But there was an enormous team that worked on the VS that never get credit. And Chris insisted that he be in there. Marcus Ryle uh, puts to rest uh, a, a very important uh, rumor that is around, which is that some people say that the Oberheim Expander had custom chips that no other synthesizer had. And other people go, well, yeah, 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 they're in the Curtis catalog. And the truth is that they are in the Curtis catalog but they didn't get in there until the Expander and Matrix 12 had been on sale for a couple of years. Doug Curtis designed those chips to Marcus Ryle's specs. The Expander and the Matrix 12 were the only machines that had them for years, and that's when they got put in the catalog and started appearing in other synthesizers. So um, there's a lot of stuff in here that is meant to be a really good resource. We've got a very nice glossary in the back. We have beautiful photo essays on the three museums. We all have a small list of resources of some other places around the world, including some that we tried to work with, but the photography was just too difficult. Um, uh, MESS in uh, Melbourne, Australia comes to mind. Um, and uh, just some really amazing stuff. And I'm really hoping that, that if you if you've never stopped to think about how pretty synthesizers are, about how inspiring they are, to, when you look at one and you sit down at it and you say, this makes me want to create music. That's what this book is for. That's what this book is about. And I'm, I'm really hoping that you'll give it a try and you know that you'll buy copies for all your friends and copies for all your enemies and uh, you know, whatever. But uh, on that note, um, I'm just going to open the floor to questions and answers, and I'm going to thank Gianni and uh, all of you and the folks at MEAP and Ben Luce, uh, Drew Raison, and Mike, uh, of course, you, for getting me to where I am now, which is being able to talk to these fantastic people and talk about my book and talk about some stuff that's, you know, near and dear to my heart. Just be glad he didn't ask me to talk about human interface on synthesizers, or you guys would be here for a week. Yeah, so um, that's part of the reason Emmy Apps exists. So I'm I'm glad that we were able to help you guys out. So here's a question: Other than commerce slash paying the bills, why did you write this book? I didn't write it for commerce at all. Okay, why did you write this book? Uh, I well, uh, you want the the facetious answer or the accurate answer? No, I want the accurate answer. The accurate I'm answer curious. is, um. The concept and design of the book are Kim's. He is the one who 
came up with it. But let me explain to you what the initial concept for synth gems one was. It was, first of all, it was only synth gems. There was no one. We figured out very quickly that it had to have a one because there was no way we weren't going to do a two and almost certainly a three and maybe even a four and five. Um, but Kim basically called it, quote, the synthesizer drool book. He said, I want a synthesizer drool book. And, you know, he and I are, are the ones who bat around these ideas before we go forward. He, he bounces everything off of me, which is an unbelievable honor that I, that's uh, just amazing. And he said, well, I want to, you know, could we think about doing the synthesizer drool book? Could we do the synthesizer drool book? And I keep asking, what is a synthesizer drool book? And he says, well, nobody's ever done a book of pictures of synthesizers for people to drool over. And? Never got any further than that. So um, we had an opportunity in our publishing schedule earlier this year uh, that um, there was a book that we are working on. It's no surprise that Bukes is working on multiple titles uh, at a time. And uh, there was one time window for a book that we were in production for that got delayed. Uh, external circumstances meant that this particular book there was a period of time we laid out to work on it and that wasn't going to work. So we had a period of time open up. It wasn't a big one either. And we were talking and I don't remember if it was him who said, maybe this is a good time to do the drool book or if it was me for my sins uh, saying it. Um, but he said, you know, now we need to, to you know, I said, well, if we're going to do it, we need to figure out what it is. And he had the idea of the beautiful pictures but then the question is, what comes with it? And this book went through a bunch of different iterations. He and I would talk probably an hour to an hour and a half a day for about a month. And the book changed a lot over time. There were initial ideas that we threw away. There were ideas we threw away and then came back to. Um, I was responsible for curating about 90% of the choices of what went into the book. And gradually as it went on I realized that as nice as it is to talk about these instruments and show pictures of them there's something deeper here because I'm not really about gear anymore I I had a massive massive aversion therapy practically electroshock treatment um in 1996 when I got to spend an hour chatting with Hans Zimmer in his main composing studio. And when I came out of that room, I had no interest in synthesizers anymore, none. It was just burned out of me because here was a guy who had gear that he was an expert on all of, that he never had time to use, and some of which he didn't even have hooked up. He had probably $60,000 worth of modular synthesizers sitting in that room, not connected to anything because he just didn't have room for them. And I asked him what he was doing with them. And he said, one, he used sometimes in the studio. So he was just having it sit there until he needed it again. And the other one he was taking home to set up next to his grand piano in the new house he just bought. So he was going to have a music room that would have this one modular synthesizer and a Steinway in it. Um, I don't know if he ever did that, but it was a good story. Uh, and what I learned in the process of doing this book is that every synthesizer has a story. It's got the history and context of where it comes from. It's got the story of the person who designed it. And some of these stories are amazing. These instruments all have the imprint of the people who designed them. There's trivia. There's funny stories. There are, there, there are heartbreaking stories. You know, one in particular that I will mention very briefly is the story of Eugene Zumchak the guy who invented the Moog Sonic 6. His story is heartbreaking. And, uh, and there are stories of triumphs and stories of massive failures. Some of the instruments that I have in there were supposed to save companies and they didn't. Some of the instruments I have in there made companies fortunes. At least one instrument was in there and it simultaneously made the company's fortune and the company died anyway. Um, so there is history, there's context, there is technology. Each of these instruments, it's explained, you know, from stem to stern, what it does. And there are detailed pictures of, of this stuff.
But what motivated me to do this book was if anybody else had approached this idea, and this is my massive ego talking, if anybody else had approached this idea, they would have done it wrong. Because the important thing about these machines is not what they are, it is what they make you feel. This book is unlike anything else that has ever been done. It is a book that is essentially the fulfillment of a fantasy. You know, there are all these gearheads who spend all their time hunting around on the internet for pictures of these rare synths. And they're all terrible. And they're all low res. And they're, they're scanned from product brochures or they're grainy pictures from live shows. You can't see anything. Here's a, here's a project for you guys. Go out on the internet and see if you can find a full color, detailed enough to read photograph of a Yamaha GX1. They don't exist. We have a 20 inch by 10 inch spread of the gorgeous GX1 at MEAP, where you can read the details on every control. And these machines, these holy grails, you, you, you get to look at the finish on them, the care that was put into them. You know, people wonder, why does the RSF COBOL have all of its connections on the front panel? It's because those connections and the rest of the front panel are all set into this gorgeous, seamless mahogany case that's a work of art in and of itself. They didn't want any holes in it. They didn't want any place where the technology broke through the art. And there are so many other stories like that. It's just, I wrote this book because once I started looking at these things and realizing that there was a way to combine an appreciation for the beauty with the ability to educate people, particularly people who don't know about synthesizers, about the innate beauty of these machines. There are any number of people who will never own a Lamborghini who love looking at pictures of muscle cars. There are any number of people who are fascinated by the Art Deco world who look at pictures of buildings that were in that design, even though they might not live in a city that has one. And so you don't have to be an electronic musician. You don't have to be an electronic music enthusiast to look at these machines and see why someone could sit down in front of one of them and say, this makes me want to create music. So very long-winded answer to a very simple question. Anybody else? Come on, guys. I, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yeah. Joe. I wanted to jump in with, a, you know, the, back to the polyphony thing. Um, it's funny that, that uh, you know, we've moved away from polyphony and in instruments. Like polyphony and multitemporality are just basically nowhere except in kind of the you know the sort of old school keyboard workstation market but it's funny for me having tons of polyphony kept me away from gas because for a huge chunk of my my early music career i had you know just a an eos class sampler 64 voices multi timbral I, anytime there was an instrument i looked at where i was like oh, that'd be really nice i just would work to find a way to make the thing do that but that that's not the technology that's the fact that you understand your instrument and you know how to use it and that is damn rare these days well that's i mean that's the sort of thing just like the now the the paradigm seems to be that like an owner's manual is a bad idea like i would look at like i got that thing and i was like oh my god the owner's manual is 400 pages this this means there's 400 pages of things I can learn to do with it, mm -hmm. but it, it's it's been interesting kind of watching the way polyphony kind of came in. You know, my I cut my teeth on an ESQ one back in the mid 80s. Great machine, and, like, and it's in the book. Yeah, but you know, it's it's weird because now like there are these paraphonics that are great. Like I got this one laying on the, the my keyboard stand, the absolute best bargain right now in oh yeah in instruments paraphonic and it's and it's paraphonic in kind of an interesting articulated way where uh -huh. it has it has envelopes for 
amplitude, just not for, you know, just not separately articulated for the filter. So it's really kind of been interesting seeing the way this stuff has sort of evolved and gone sideways. You know, the Pro 2 and the Pro 3 are, are paraphonic in that way as well. It's, it's and the Matrix Brute. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's, this is a good time to be alive. You know, people ask me, you know, well, this great rich history of electronic music, you know, there must be an era you would have rather lived in. And I'm like, hell no. What are <laughs> you kidding me? The, the yeah. 1970s, you know, yeah, you could get a mini Moog for only $1,200, but it was $1,200 in 1975. Yeah. You know? well, that, it, and, and Mellotrons, uh, you know, my favorite Mellotron. This is my favorite Mellotron right here. It's an oh, iPad. Yeah. yeah. You know? A, a real Mellotron? God help me. Never. Oh, Never. I, I can personally contest to that. <laughs> I, you know, I know what they sound like, and I know they have the character. I know that every time you engage the motors, you get a different sound, and it's living and breathing. And s no, Mike, just yeah. no. Oh, I, I agree need, with you. I don't need that. I don't need that kind of character in my life yeah they're, they're fun to play with but uh, on stage forget about it forget well yeah it. and and you know and if you want to keep one working you know uh p hicks who who does the big thing about a uh, big website about mellotrons and optigans and that sort of thing he says if you really want to be good at working on mellotrons the very first thing you buy for your repair shop is the engine block crane for cars yeah. Because the only way you can work on a Mellotron without wrecking your back is yeah. to lift the guts out of the shell on an engine block crane. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, you know, I just don't have room for an engine block crane in my life right now. So See, like I, back in the 80s, RMI did a gig at the October Gallery in London. And that gallery is in the third floor of a Victorian building with no elevator. Is that the one that became upstairs, downstairs? That's the one, yeah. <laughs> Duncan and Steve carried that up the back stairs by hand. Yeah, and you know what? Knowing Duncan, he was perfectly happy to do it. Oh, yeah, yeah most Lots. definitely. <laughs> you know, and, and my attitude is, you know, they're, they're a fun band, but I personally listen to them because I think their music is good. I really don't care about the pile of gear. Um, you know, and it was a real problem because when... when um, well, this is a cultural thing, but a lot of the electronic albums uh, of the day really made it a point to list all the instruments. Yeah. And what you end up with is you you look at, at the at this gear list and you say, well, I don't hear all of it. And the fact is, you know, you might have only used one piece for two notes. But, uh, you know, I will never forget this absolutely scathing review that Robert Carlberg did. Um, of uh, the very last album that the Nightcrawlers uh, created, Shadows of Light. And it opened with the phrase, using a room full of synths and a bag full of ideas. And you didn't have to read any further. There was nobody who didn't know who the Nightcrawlers were that would ever buy this LP. Uh, you know, so, so one of the reasons why I don't list my gear is because I, I know that there are people who are curious. I give interviews like this for people who want to know. But on the record, I want the music to, to, to speak for itself. The last experience I had was five years ago. I released a solo CD called Fade. And Fade sold very well in the first few weeks. because and, and people kept asking me, this gear is amazing. Whose modular did you borrow? What kind of digital synths were you using? <laughs> and in one blog, in one blog, I made the mistake of saying that I did the entire CD on an iPad and sales gone yeah. to zero in the space of 48 hours. <laughs> That's completely silly. It is, I mean, but it's, it, you know, Poindexter leaves a, a, a concert pissed off because the Mellotron was in software. Poindexter has no idea what's going on in Somalia right now, but he will argue to the death over whether SSM chips are better than Curtis chips. <laughs> yeah. You know? And, and, you know, listen, playing with modular synthesizers or being interested in repairing old synths, even, you know, you can find web pages where there are huge numbers of intricate schematics and repair and upgrade schemes for digital keyboards that most people have forgotten about. The Roland U20 has a fan 
club, you know? And the fact is, that's a beautiful thing. If that's what makes you happy, if that's your happy place, if you play with modulars, never intending to make an album, but just because the act of creating and working with sound is a meditative practice, that's awesome. And go. But, but when you are in a situation where you're far more worried about the equipment than you are about the sounds that's coming out of it, that just sits wrong with me. And that's one of the reasons why I don't get along with Poindexters because at some point or another, I just, I can't listen anymore. And, um, you know, I mean, if, uh, I'm sorry that you can't see my studio, but, but the camera is mounted on my computer, which is the direction I face with my monitors. I've got keyboards on either side of me. Um, and I have right now three keyboards in my entire studio. And one of them is only here for a tutorial video uh, uh, setup I'm doing. And as soon as I'm done with these tutorials, it is gone. I never want to see it again. Uh, I'm happy with two keyboards. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, it works for me. I sold my Oberheim expander after 34 years because it no longer did what I needed it to. And I wanted it to go to a good home with somebody who'd take care of it. You know, I, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm weird. I'm a synth geek who just did a book of synth porn. It's flat out synth porn. Um, who doesn't care about synth porn? And I think that that degree of objectivity and looking at these things from a, a, a visual artistic standpoint rather than a technical standpoint made all the difference. And I think that's why the book is going to last because it's just, it's not written from somebody who spends all of his time drooling over this stuff. It's a synthesizer drool book written for people who drool over synthesizers by somebody who doesn't. And, um, you know, I guess I'm, a, I'm, I'm an expert pastry chef who's allergic to chocolate or something. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, I think a lot of it is people uh, like me, because I felt my needle swings a little bit to the Poindexter side, perhaps. Yep. Um, but at the same time. Mike, your I music need... is gorgeous. Oh, thank Anybody you. who thinks that you're too obsessed with tech needs to listen to, to the, the last Ombient album. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. It's the truth. Uh, you know, I, people ask me, if you don't collect synthesizers, I'm like, I collect people. Every single uh, one of you guys, every single one of you guys is a limited edition, one unit, special edition music oh, sure. creation machine. Absolutely. And, you know, and, you. and you guys are what's special. I can, I can sound like myself on anything. I have the performance tropes that are, um, you know, that are recognizably me. But what makes my music beautiful is when I work with other people and I incorporate their ideas. Oh, so. certainly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can't always be in a vacuum. You'll, you won't progress. I, I, uh, I, I guess my comment was, um, you know, I have a ridiculous, certainly not Emmy app scale, but I have kind of a ridiculous collection of synthesizers. And I would agree with stuff. that. I would agree and, with uh, that. I think it is, you, in fact, ridiculous. But, 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 but here's the interesting thing is that 98% of it lives in a storage unit that's temperature controlled. And it only one or two pieces come out at a time. And when I record, I limit myself. Okay, I'm going to use this, this, and this, and that's it. And yep. if there's something I can't do, then I don't do it. Or I figure out a way to do it with what I've got. And that made my productivity. Because I used to have everything set up, and I would turn everything on. And you stare at it. And you stare, at it. And you stare at it. You, you try to use everything. It. Yeah, it's, it's couldn't yep. agree more. So yep. I, I, I completely get it. But at the same time, I'm probably a collector too. So it's well, you are, but to, that's uh, okay. I yeah. don't mind people like you collecting because you produce stuff. Yeah, I'm, sure. a, I'm a big believer in that. Um, I am going to, uh, uh, Gianni, you've been trying to get a word in edgewise for about five minutes now. Um, yes. Are we out of time? or? I think we're, we, we should call it a day at this point. Unless you want to go on for longer. Um, well, I don't mind ending the recorded part of the session, but if people want to talk about this stuff, I'm happy to. I just want to put in one more plug, if I may. Um, if you look at um, what's about to pop up in uh, chat, make sure I spelled it right. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I run an online radio station called Radio Spiral. Um, radio Spiral is 24-7. We have a collection of... Um, 
uh, ambient electronic and experimental music, uh, space music, uh, and so on. Uh, we've got a, a catalog of about 16,000 titles. Um, and uh, this is all either Creative Commons or commercially available stuff where the owner has specifically signed a waiver. Um, so there's a lot of music you'll have heard of and a lot of music you, you won't. Uh, it's uh, a, a great environment, and what makes it really interesting is that we have live shows um, uh, once every, uh, pretty much every night now, um, uh, usually at 6 p.m. Pacific, which I know is very tough for Europe, um, but we also do all-day concerts. Our next all-day concert, which is going to have nine or ten live acts, will start at 11 a.m. Pacific on October 30th. Um, we're going to have at least eight hours of music, maybe 10. Mike Hunter, you've got to play. We want, we want you, you there. Um, and, um, we also have an, an interactive presence where people sign on to do chat during the radio shows and people will talk about the music and talk to each other. It's a very friendly group. And we have both the discord channel, which you can access from, uh, the website. And if you're into uh, virtual reality, we have a presence in second life. And um, we have people who gather there and talk about the music, which is kind of fun. I play live most weeks as part of my show. Almost all of our hosts are musicians and they'll be spinning tunes and they'll suddenly say, you know what, it's time for me to play live. And they'll fire up their studio and they'll play for 10, 15, 20, sometimes 60 minutes. And then they go back to spinning tunes again. Um, it's so you get live improvised music. And I'll tell you something, when I play live, I use two iPads and, you know, that's just, you know, where my head is right now. So, um, you know, it, give Radio Spiral a, a try. If it's not your cup of Java, that's fine. But, um, you know, that was the one thing I wanted to, to shout out. And of course, bukes.com, you can pre-order or order the book and um, try the other titles. They're all amazing in their own ways. And this is different than any of them. They're all, they're all unique. But they're all as alike as, as, as Mike and Ike compared to this book. This book is something genuinely new. And I'm really hoping folks enjoy it. So are we good? Well, thank, are we good? You, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike Mepley, for this in, insightful and inspirational workshop. Uh, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. I'm a fan of uh, Radio Spiral down there. I do listen from mm -hmm. time to time. I enjoy mm -hmm. it. And, uh, and what I wanted to mention is uh, thank you very much for pointing out all the offer you received in the book. Well, the, 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 these people, these people also, work hard, and it really is a book about people as much as it uh, is about machines. But also, please give us uh, a link at some point to where we can get some copies that are autographed by you. So that this oh, with with the with, the, with the, Johnny Johnny <laughs> with with the pandemic the way it is. Autographing is really hard because all of these books come from a central distribution center. I would have to get them come to me. I would have to sign yeah. them. And then I would have right. to figure out how to get them to you. And it's likely yeah. to be a very expensive proposition. Sure. You know? Uh, so no, basically, no, I'll, I'll bring your copy to Superbooth and I'll sign it. Okay. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mapley. Um, time for a workshop. And uh, we'll see you at Superboot. Thank you very uh, much. That's my hope. <laughs>